Hello, my name is Dia Mehra and I am an assistant professor of sociology at the South Asian University. Today, this PowerPoint lecture is uh, titled Qualitative Research Methods in Social Cultural Anthropology and uh, Sociology, and that is what I will be talking about. Okay, so a good uh, place to start would be to think about what is sociology and um, social anthropology. Um, since we are talking about social science research in these two fields. Now, uh, Giddens, as you can see on the slide in grey, that's the source material, defines sociology, social anthropology as the scientific study of human social life, groups and uh, societies. Now, this, uh, makes, this definition makes the scope of these two fields very large. Uh, it can, analysis can range from how people establish social connections with one another to the investigation of global social processes such as the rise of Islamic uh, fundamentalism. And one of the keystones uh, in the approaches in sociology and social anthropology is not to think of human life as either natural, inevitable, good or true, right? Uh, or in even biological entirely, but to suggest in fact that our lives are strongly influenced by historical, cultural, social and even technological um, forces and understanding how these uh, different forces intersect to impact our life and what our experience of these forces are is central to the sociological um, outlook. Uh, Giddens here quotes a very famous American sociologist, C. Uh, Wright Mills, uh, who observed that social sciences enable people to translate private troubles into public issues. What he means by that, that things that you might experience in your individual life and you think of as personal issues uh, arising from your own uh, situations, but actually these are in fact larger public issues and represent in fact the consequences of social structures that we all uh, live with and in. Now, um, as an example of this, uh, we can try and think about the simple act of drinking a cup of coffee. Um, what would a sociological point of view illustrate about something that happens routinely that we all do uh, or many of us do in different contexts? First of all, uh, coffee possesses symbolic value as part of our daily social activities. Often the ritual, that is the act of sitting with your cup of coffee and drinking it, is often more important than the act itself. Now uh, let's take this act and think about what happens, how would you interpret a situation where two people arrange to meet for a coffee, right? So the coffee is there. It is a thing that organizes this meeting, but uh, the thing of drinking and eating in all societies is not just a physical act, right? It is a way of promoting certain kinds of sociality, social interaction. Um, and in this case, the what is the interaction between these two people who have met up for this cup of coffee? The drinking of the coffee is not only about the two people who are sitting down and their interaction. It is also about the coffee itself, right? The coffee itself is produced through a complicated set of social and economic relations stretching across the world, right? The production and distribution of coffee requires continuous transactions among people who may be many uh, thousands of miles away from each other or from the coffee drinker itself. So that cup of coffee or that uh, consumption of that cup of coffee is also then telling of those dynamics, right? Then there is the context of, in fact, the cafe in which you might be sitting to have this coffee, right? Cafe culture is something also that can be interpreted sociologically and um, anthropologically. Uh, the slide points out uh, that, in fact, uh, the drinking of the cup of coffee also tells us something about our own um, histories and development, right? Because, in fact, till the late 1800s, um, uh, things that we now take as standard food in our diets, coffee, tea, bananas, potatoes, etc., they were not available. They only came with the colonization of certain parts of the world, that is South America and Africa. Um, and in that sense, um, uh, drinking of coffee, or the act of drinking coffee, is also telling of a history of development of our contemporary lives. Okay, this slide is an attempt to think about what is social cultural anthropology. Social anthropology, as it's often called in India, is opposed to sociology. So um, I don't want to go into a long story here, but basically socio, social anthropology, um, social cultural anthropology 
differs a bit from sociology because it emerged in fact in the process of colonization itself uh, and rather than think of social structures which is what happened in the case of sociology in the west as uh, colonial uh, colonists started to encounter different peoples around the world they started to ask questions about culture right and the idea was that humans ascribe meanings of their creation to objects persons behaviors emotions events and acts right things are meaningful to us and this meaningfulness is what we think of as um, culture right so all humans experience birth death uh, a need for food shelter etc etc but what this means and how these uh, rights of passes are enacted differs greatly from culture to culture right and we're not talking here about national cultures but also uh, multicultural societies right and india is a good example of it the same uh, act of eating could be very different in different kinds of states so socio cultural anthropology um, is particularly interested in meaning right cultural meaning that is attached to uh, everyday forms of life by different sets of people now despite a different in focus sociology on social structures and uh, social cultural anthropology on cultural meaning what is common in both cases is that they are both sciences in fact they are both social sciences and closely linked because frankly at this point uh, sociologists look at cultural forms and social anthropologists look at social structure and they always have so what is science science is the use of systemic methods of empirical investigation the analysis of data theoretical thinking and the logical assessment of arguments to develop a body of knowledge about a particular subject matter sociology and social anthropology are scientific endeavors social scientists they involve systematic methods of empirical investigation the analysis of data and the assessment of theories in the light of evidence and logical argument right and so this is also true right of biology chemistry physics etc what we call the hard sciences that is their theoretical models are either built on evidence empirical investigation or they are tested through empirical evidence uh, that is their theoretical models right so um, in that sense the social science is are similar evidence Uh, of the everyday of the empirical of our everyday lives is in fact on the basis on which theoretical models are built critiqued or uh, refuted now high quality sociological research goes beyond surface level descriptions of ordinary life rather it helps us understand our social lives in a new way so sociologists are interested in the same questions that other people worry about in debate why do racism and sexism exist how can mass starvation exist in a world that is far wealthier than it has ever been before how does the internet affect our lives however uh, for sociologists and anthropologists these questions can only be answered after investigation of collection of data and its analysis and often they develop answers that run counter to our common sense belief um, and generate other questions now a lodestone of this kind of research is that all ideas are open to criticism and revision right so in contrast to religion for example where uh, ideas about uh, uh, religious practice uh, deities faith etc are fixed in uh, the social sciences sociology anthropology the presumption is that all ideas can be revised and are open to critique okay so it says here on this slide from berg so berg is the author at the end of this presentation you will have a, find a list of authors and the readings um, and these are indicated in the presentation as we go along so that you can be aware of uh, which material is coming from which text and you can consult the text if you'd like so what is the objective of sociological or social anthropological research so one primary purpose is to make sense of social patterns right of politics economics development gender media anything constructed by humans and in fact sociology and social anthropologists work on the basis that our entire world in fact is in some way a construction of uh, human activity thought etc so this uh, uh, understanding of patterns is accomplished by creating and examining testing and refining theories so what then is theory theory can be defined as a general and more or less comprehensive set of statements or propositions that describe different aspects of some phenomenon um 
Um, so social scientists usually define theory as a system of logical statements or propositions that explains the relationship between two or more objects, concepts, phenomena, characteristics of humans, what are sometimes called variables. So for example, one can ask the question, what is the relationship between wider socioeconomic changes and changes in marriage rituals, right? Or you can ask the question of, how does receiving advanced higher education impact gender roles, right? So we're trying to assess the relationship between one phenomena um, and the other. So as you can see, all of these questions cannot be answered simply. They require, in fact, for us to go out and do some research. So good sociological work also tries to make the questions as precise as possible and seeks to gather factual evidence before coming to any conclusion. So here is a set of questions that you can try and think about. A factual question, what happened? So here we are asking the question of, did the proportion of women in their 40s bearing children for the first time increase, decrease or stay the same during the 2010s? To answer this question, you have to go and get data that looks at childbirth and at what age women had kids. Comparative question. Is it this phenomena of women having children late in their 40s? Did it happen everywhere? Was this a global phenomena? Did it occur just in the West, in Europe and the United States? Again, you have to go out and get research data on all of the different childbirth patterns in different countries and assess. Development questions. Has this happened over time? What has been the patterns of childbearing over time? So is it then that there is a shift, there is an actual shift? In other words, are there more women having children late in their 40s than previously? Again, to answer this question, you require some data. And then, of course, a theoretical question, why? If it is true, why are more women now waiting until their 30s and older to bear children? How can we explain this fact, right? So that would then... Uh, uh, leave us after we've concluded this research with a series of theoretical uh, uh, statements that explain the relationship between later childbirth and whatever phenomena we find to be critical to this uh, development. So how would we go about doing this research to answer any of these questions, right? So this is the steps in the research process. First we have to define the problem, that is select a topic for research. Then we have to review the evidence. Obviously, we're not the first people who are going to do this research, so we have to go out and look at what other people have done. Then we have to try and think about what are we going to try and ask in our research, right? What uh, do we test? What is the relationship between which variables? What are we trying to investigate? Then we have to select a research design, right? There are many different kinds of research methods that can be used in the social sciences, uh, and uh, we have to choose one of them. Then we have to actually carry out the research. Once we've gathered the data, we have to uh, analyze this data and interpret the results. And finally, we have to write up these results and present them with some kind of conclusion. What have we found in our research? What does it tell us about the relationship between the different variables that we sought to investigate? So going from a, uh, this is called in the social sciences, operationalizing our research right so uh, the first step is to actually define in terms of concepts terms relationships sub questions what you are researching vis-a-vis -vis the thematic you've chosen and in relationship to the literature that already exists once you've defined the relationship concept or term that you are studying we have to try and find a way to measure it empirically right we need evidence because we are in fact a science so how are we going to measure this evidence that we need to answer our question. So the first step to uh, starting a research project is to do a literature review, right? Because you want to find out what other people have done on the same topic, what have they understood of it. So if the question is, how do local people understand ethnic riots? The theory is, how have others theorized about the topic, methods, how have others researched the topic, findings, what have others found in previous research? your project in relation to the literature. Is there an interesting angle or approach that would set your research apart from that of others or refine findings offered in past research? So a literature review thus helps you define your research problem and questions, provides you with starting points to find a theoretical frame to work with, provides key concepts and ideas, provides key facts and information, and provides a guide to 
think about how you will study your question empirically that is what method you will choose now what do we mean by defining concepts say you are interested in studying to what degree or extent people are religious but what does it mean religious it's an abstraction a concept right uh, for example religious will be defined here as how actively one is involved with her or his religion now how are we going to map this active involvement in religion right what are the indicators for it so after consulting the literature you might decide that you know that being religious is uh, knowing whether a person believes in a divine being attends organized religious services on some regular basis prays at home reads religious materials celebrate certain religious holidays declares membership in a particular religion participates in religious social organizations and contributes to religious charities so now we know how we're going to think about religion and how we're going to map someone's involvement with their religion so the literature review then has given you a starting point to think about how you will empirically measure your uh, the answer that you're looking for right so uh, the second part then after you've done a literature review defined your concepts for found a frame and thought of a method is to decide how to measure the empirical existence of your research focus now this is a movement from a theoretical question the question we were asking for example is uh, about uh, how do people understand ethnic riots right so you have to try and take that from a theoretical question to a practical research question something you can actually go out there and research and this involves a move from abstraction to particularity and what uh, we mean by that i will explain in the next slide so you have to try and think about this movement from theory to a researchable problem in the uh, shape of a funnel right where the top part is the broadest and then you get a narrowing down so uh, in this quest slide we are going to ask the question what does it mean to be a modern woman now that is the larger macro question uh but we are going to define this question because modern itself can be mapped in many ways so uh we can ask the question of what does it mean to be modern in contemporary india if being modern is defined as being able to seek employment of choice as a woman right so now we conceptually refined our terms right um what does it mean the third part further reduction what does it mean and how does it feel to be a north indian woman in uh, india seeking work what is her capacity to do this so now we have defined an empirical field right we are only going to talk about north indian women right we are only going to talk about seeking work right and we are going to uh, uh, define in our research that our uh, idea of modern is about seeking employment of choice right and so we've gone from a large question what does it mean to be modern as a modern woman to researching a very specific aspect of this because of course no one in their lifetime can research all aspects of being modern so you might say as a researcher i can't actually uh, uh, map someone's modernness right but i can or religiousness but i can think about what elements seek to go into making up or represent observable behaviors understood to mean religious or modern in this case depending on which question you go with so by obtaining information regarding the subset of observable attributes delineated earlier to represent religious or modern you can study religiosity or modernity right the assumption being that, for example in the case of modern uh, women that um there is a certain cap uh, capacity to freely seek work that is associated with the modern in the indian context while in other cases women might be denied this capacity uh, because it's considered uh, against traditional gender roles of course the subset of this question already is is that some women have no option but to work because they require the financial means to support their families right so in defining your question then you will also start to start thinking about who is it that i am researching right which women yeah um and that is the question we will take up when we come to sampling 
yeah so the question here is at this point when we are doing our literature review and trying to think of methods is we are trying to think about observable attributes things that we can actually see and map in the real world in people's lives that will help us answer uh, our question right so once you have a sense of the data you need for your project defined as what is observable or knowable in your particular case you need to think of what kind of social science qualitative method will help you get that data um so what research methods do sociologists and social anthropologists use so sociologists have a range of methods at their disposal While methods are often qualified as qualitative or quantitative, scholars today are increasingly interested in mixed methods which combine the two. And this lecture is going to focus mainly on qualitative methods, which can be defined broadly as approaches that explore the deeper meaning of a particular setting. Sociologists using qualitative methods may rely on personal and collective accounts or observations of a person or a situation. These observations are strictly subjective. suggesting an interpretive approach to describing actors and their social context quantitative methods by contrast use data that are objective and statistical this type of research often focuses on documenting trends comparing subgroups or exploring correlations so we are going to talk about key qualitative methods in sociology and social anthropology and we are also going to talk a little bit about why sometimes these methods are what we require right uh, and they can be read in fact as a complement to quantitative uh, analysis in as much as if the quantitative analysis uh, reveals a certain kind of pattern that's what quantitative analysis does if you do a quantitative survey of large numbers of people you will see a pattern but then you want to ask questions about that pattern and for that you this is the deeper meaning right why is it happening how is it happening how do people feel about it etc etc then you start using qualitative methods right okay so uh, the first qualitative method we're going to talk about is participant observation field work right um so in this case you are in fact a participant in the life of those you are uh, looking at or in situations or events etc that you are trying to study so you will likely learn a lot by observing and participating as part of a larger group but you will probably quickly become aware of things that you need to learn ideally you will identify a regular event or a series of events that you can attend as a participant observer as a cornerstone of your research plan this sort of regular planned participant observation will help you get started help structure your research and help you build relationships with potential informants so at the heart of participant observation then is the fact that you are going to invest a lot of time in your field site observing participating in things that happen getting to know people and through this uh, close encounter and immersion you start gaining knowledge that will help you in fact answer your questions participation uh, and observation involves inhabiting a space over a period of time you have to identify good situations and locations for participant observation and sometimes this could be for example you could become an apprentice now once you are in the field and you are in fact observing and participating you might also seek to do interviews right which is actually talking to and listening to people as key parts of this uh, um, process in these exchanges between the scholar and the informants the scholar has chance to gain explicit knowledge that is to be taught directly and ask for clarification or follow up on things observed or explained uh, previously So through these conversations and interviews you can obtain detailed explanations and rationales as well as background information that will help you make sense of other pieces of information you can ask people for example how they feel another kind of oral uh, a qualitative method is oral histories and biographies right and that's when you try and map a person's life or a life situation of an institution event over time um in terms of mixed methods you can supplement this participant observation and interviews with an or oral histories with other kinds of data maps charts visual data photographs popular media right um and finally you can do surveys although that is not the subject of this lecture 
Now, a survey usually involves the development of a survey instrument. You go out and administer it to a number of people. Usually, the questions either involve answers that are actually given. You can the, the person who's answering the question has a choice they can make: yes, no, a lot, a little, a, a never. Or they can sometimes be some small open-ended questions, right? But surveys are not, in fact, ideally designed for um, in-depth conversation or in-depth observation, right? So in, when we talk about mixed methods, the idea then being that the survey may reveal a pattern and the other methods, the qualitative methods, interviews and participation, observation, help you make sense of how and why this pattern is occurring, what people feel uh, about it, how they experience it, now, in any research design and when you are putting together this project, you need to try and think about how you will use these different methods, participant observation, interviewing, mapping and charts. So mapping and charts may refer to, for example, you might actually map people's space, for example, or charts may refer to other kinds of phenomena that you cannot directly observe, right? So, for example, political economy phenomena, right, people's economic situation or the political situation or, for example, media that they engage with that informs their own view of life or how they go about something. These are things that are larger than the field site or the location that you might site yourself in. But you will pay attention to them because they do impact how people experience and understand the world. So you need to answer the questions of when, where and how in as uh, detailed a manner as possible. So when you come up with the project then, you try and think about what kind of information or data will be gathered, where will this happen, among what group or groups of people, right? Are you going to do this participant observation? Are you going to do this um, these interviews, right? Who we are going to try and pay some attention to. So um, this question then of where, how, uh, etc. Um, is a practical question. It's not only one that is about conceptuality or uh, doing the best. For example, uh, I often tell my students, uh, maybe you want to uh, uh, study, for example, the, uh, uh, the setup of the homes of Bollywood stars. But the thing is, you're never going to be able to access these homes, right? So the question of accessibility is probably the single most important practical concern. So if you're trying to think of religiosity, how people understand ethnic riots, how is it that uh, women can conceive of themselves as modern, we are not going to go out and interview all women in North India or even in Delhi, right? It's impossible. So we need some kind of sample, right? And to think about that kind of sample, the uh, one very critical issue is to think about can I access these people? Can I access these sites where I will be able to do uh, participant observation? In uh, some cases, certain individuals are in a position to grant or deny access to particular field sites, resources and people, and these people are called gatekeepers. They may occupy formal positions of authority, for example, government officials or religious leaders or others might function as informal gatekeepers, for example, family leaders or elders or healers, right? So you're going to have to approach these people and see whether you can actually access a set of people or a site. So in general, you have to be quite comfortable that you will be able to access the people you want to talk to or observe or spend time with. Otherwise, you have to be prepared to rework your design. And uh, one of the problems the pandemic, of course, is creating for this kind of research is that it's very hard for us to go out and talk to large numbers of people. Uh, but at other times, the other practical question that we ask is how much time we have, right? So I might want to study uh, lots of different kinds of people or lots of different kinds of women or lots of different kinds of religious practice, but do I have enough time to do it, right? So whatever research design and method you choose has to be practicable apart from fitting the uh, project that you have come up with. Okay, so the study site or setting should be a location where entry or access is possible. The appropriate people, the target population, are likely to be available. So if you're studying the capacity of women to choose their employment freely, um, you need, we already feel like we have to talk to those women who are not uh, compelled to work, right? So can we access those kinds of women? There is high probability that the study focuses, processes, people 
uh, programs, interactions and or structures that are part of the research question are available to the investigator and the research can be conducted effectively by an individual or individuals. So you have to also th think about how you'll position yourself, how will you introduce yourself, what will people make of you, or will there be any ethical problems you may face. For example, if you are doing a survey or study of a bazaar and you try and talk to people about their business, for example, how is it going in the pandemic, they might tell you about a series of practices that are frankly illegal, right? Now, what will you do with this information? How will you present it, right? So any information you receive from people has to be treated uh, also with a set of ethics, right? And ethics that are in, uh, fundamentally premised on the fact that you do not reveal something of, about them or their lives that is harmful to them because they have told you something in good faith. So as you s then start preparing for field work, here is an example. If you decide you're going to interview people, you should ask what are the kinds of questions you're going to ask, like what are the kinds of responses we want to get, who are we going to interview, are we going to do formal interviews where we show up with a tape recorder maybe like journalists do and a letter of introduction, sit down with someone, ask them for some time or are we going to do informal interviews where you kind of hang out in a space, right? Say for example you're studying a theatre company, you just go to the rehearsals and you hang out and you chat to people. Will you ask open-ended questions? What's an open-ended question? An open-ended question is an question that doesn't have a determined answer in advance right so if I ask the question in a survey and give you the options of giving you either yes answer or no answer that's a close uh, ended question right but if I ask you how did you feel about the fact that you were now in this lockdown for two months that's an open-ended question and what you're hoping to get then is a narrative a story from this person you're interviewing or what did it feel like to convince your parents to be able to allow you to seek this work that's a narrative right and this narrative story is going to tell you how people feel about their circumstances how they did something it's going to give you a lot of information this is the deeper meaning that qualitative methods seeks to ask and then the question is how many people are you going to interview right in a given uh, place and setting what is an appropriate um, sample so how will we build a sample through contacts participant observation you might meet people random selection or other means and what criteria will be used to select them now in choosing who to decide to talk to you will want to talk about think about who is the most knowledgeable or experienced but you also want to think about representativeness right which is that do I have women of uh, different backgrounds of different ages of different ethnicity if that question is critical to your project because if you do not think about all of these things then your findings eventually you will be told okay but you have only studied women of a particular kind so your findings only then reflect those uh, and if you want to make a claim that extends beyond that particular group, you have to make sure that they are in the sample. So what are the different kinds of samples? So what we are going to talk about here is uh, non-probabilistic samples, right? So we are not trying to in fact statistically uh, uh, arrive at a sample, but qualitatively to think about a sample. Okay, now the first part is to think about who is the entire universe who could potentially be studied for your project if this is possible? That is the sampling frame. For example, if you look at sex workers in Sri Lanka, you can think about those who work on the street, those who work in hotels or bars, those who work from home, and I guess now we would add those who work online, right? So that is the sampling, the entire universe. Then the question is, out of these, who are you going to talk to? So in qualitative methods, we have different kinds of samples. The first is the convenience samples, right? I talk to whoever I could meet. Um, it can start with some few key informants or gatekeepers. Some people you meet initially, they could uh, uh, refer you to somebody else that they know. At that point, you start building a snowball or chain referral samples, right? When one person refers you to another, and as you uh, go along, you get more and more people, right? You can think of quota samples. Make sure you have achieved adequate representativeness, right? I have people who are of different classes. I have people of different ethnicities. I have people of different ages. I have people of different genders, right? Now, whether you require this representativeness to what extent depends very much on your project, right? So if you're studying a religious ritual, if you get a representative sample to some extent, then you'll be able to 
show in your research multiple perspectives the old young women men etc uh, etc right but you might decide no i'm going to work on a criteria based or purpose for example right so i'm going to choose only sex workers who work from the street for example right so there is a criteria on which you choose now if you are people following a particular event people associated with that event people representing different sides of the story right that might be the reason why you choose a certain kind of sample different political positions perspectives offices firms etc right because different people who are positioned differently will tell a different story so if you are uh studying an urban festival you can try and think about sample subsets right so my object of study is this urban festival i want to understand what people's experience of it what it what its meaning is in the urban landscape then you try and think of different subsets so you think of the organizers right key informants and gatekeepers and then you think of the attendees hopefully with some sort of representativeness across attendees right because that will give you then the capacity to talk about for example at the end it is a festival that's only enjoyed by young people it's only enjoyed by women with most of the people who come are men the organizers just try to include so many different sets of people for this and that purpose but they were unable to do it etc etc so in that case you might work with sample subsets you might also choose to focus on a particular case right and so you might build your research a set around a set of case studies right so i'm not trying to achieve representativeness i am trying to build in depth a few cases now cases can also be used in different ways uh, you can talk to the experts of it on a particular topic that is a reputational sample you can talk about cases that are extreme in your situation right uh, because they might reflect on other aspects you can talk about a typical case right so if you do a study of a bazaar you can think of a typical shop right you might think about unique cases everybody else in my sample experienced phenomena a as this but there were some people who had a very unique experience right you might think of intensive cases you know there are books that are written on the lives of entirely one people or one set of people in a household or one family etc or you might compare cases right so that is another approach you can take now you have to be aware of sampling bias who have i the criteria on which you are including and excluding people it could be a issue entirely of convenience i just couldn't access a certain set of people persons uh, that's okay the important thing is is that you have to be aware right of what are the limitations of what it is that you are doing in most cases you will have to rework your sample as your knowledge of an area grows this will allow you to further identify how to assess your cases are they unique typical make an assessment of who could should be probably included in a sample and ensure that you have achieved representativeness if important right so you might discover in this urban festival i thought it was the organizers and the attendees but there's also the question of who is it the performers or the musicians etc etc maybe i need to interview them as well right or a certain group of people i thought didn't come to the festival but actually they do come yeah so you can start with a convenient or snowball sample just anyone you meet who's willing to talk to you and eventually you will have to answer questions on criteria for inclusion exclusion and the issue of representativeness right why have you not included any young people in your study or why have you only included people of a certain caste or ethnicity etc etc because what that means is is that your findings are only about the sample that you have selected right and they don't actually uh, uh, apply to people who are not included right so you can talk to the experience of all people but you really can't talk to the experience of young people so um, while doing this kind of research whether you are using doing oral histories or you are doing participant observation or you are doing open ended interviews you will find that in a qualitative research project the focus will likely change and evolve over the course of the project this is to be expected right because it, unlike a survey quantitative methods where you've already come up with an instrument and administered it this process has a capacity to allow you to take what you have already learned and then readjust your own questions and your own focus accordingly right 
in the case of a survey, you will only find this out once you have finished the survey, right? And then if you want to explore something else, you have to write yet another survey. But in this process where you are basically uh, observing people, hanging out with them, meeting them, talking to them, you can shift focus very quickly, right? Because it's a question of what question you're going to ask um, next. So many uh, discoveries happen as you learn from people and pay attention to what is important to them rather than what you thought was important when you went into the field. The more thought you've given to a specific research topic, the more prepared, the more you will be able to adapt and refine your approach over the course of your research. And this is a helpful process, right? Uh, because it allows you to evaluate what you have already learned, what is it that you need to know, what kinds of questions you need to ask, and how you should shift your focus. So here is an example from uh, Gerald Behrman, who studied life in Shirkanda, a Pahari-speaking village in North India. Now, Behrman started out with an interpreter sister in Sharma, who ate neither meat nor drank alcohol. When he started his work with this assistant, the villagers uh, said they neither ate meat nor drank alcohol, right? And they they, he couldn't see them doing this around him or his assistant. But three months later into the research, Sharma, his assistant, falls ill and Behrman hires a young school teacher to fill in. When the villagers find that the new assistant does eat meat and drinks alcohol, things broke wide open and Behrman found that they were often uh, intercast meat and liquor parties. He didn't find out, right, till the villagers felt like they could tell him. So it's not that only you are observing people, people are also observing you. And people are getting to know you and gaining com uh, comfort with you. And as they gain this comfort, it is then that they start, in fact, telling you things that they might not have told you previously. So even then, it took Behrman six months in Shirkanda before people felt comfortable performing animal sacrifices when he was around. Right? So qualitative methods then are really about immersion, immersion into a life world, right? Um, and rather than trying to get a snapshot picture which surveys often reveal, uh, a qualitative approach uh, means that you do interviews, you do participant observation, you hang out with people, you talk to them, you become a part of their life over time and as you get to know them as you is in any other kind of social situation, more and more things open up and therefore you change your practice, your focus, your questions accordingly. So this is what we call an ethnographic approach, right? Uh, or what this is what participant observation means. And what is its difference between that and other kinds of qualitative research which include surveys or doing only interviews, right? So um, it's an orientation to the culture, to the idea of culture as a heuristic, something as you can interpret and on which you build a thick description, right? You use, in fact, people's behaviors and experiences to understand what something means to them, right? Rather than imposing your own logic on a situation, you have to be particularly focused on the relationship between you and these other people because as we've seen in the previous slide, people will tell you about their lives as much as they feel some kind of affinity with you. Um, so if your research then is built on how much affinity people you are working with or studying have towards you, you have to pay very close attention to the ethics of interacting with them, right? And finally, because as you can imagine with your own lives, the more person gets to know you, the more your life, life is complex, there are many different aspects and many different facets of anyone's lives, beliefs, practices, etc. You have to th think about this as things that are contextual or relational, right? Rather than fixed and position free. So a uh, little later on we'll talk about this in the form of the fact that you might find, for example, that there is a difference between what people say and what people do. So someone might tell you in an interview, I'm very religious, I go to church every day or every week. But then you, if you hang out and do participant observation, you will find that they, although this person says this, actually they don't go, right? What does this tell us about religiosity, right? About what it is that you are trying to study, right? Uh, and this kind of contradiction or this kind of complexity is only available when you actually spend this kind of time trying to understand people's lives, worlds from their perspectives, right? Does this person 
uh, think of himself as religious? Why does he claim that he goes to church when he doesn't? Is he the other forms of expression of this religiosity? What is his relationship with the church, etc., etc.? A whole set of questions could arise from that. So, when do we need this kind of ethnographic, critical, in-depth, qualitative information? Um, you don't always need it. For example, you don't need to do this kind of research to learn about the official duties of a healthcare worker in Tanzania or India or any other matter. These duties are clearly defined in government literature that defines these positions. However, if you want to understand how these healthcare workers cope with chronic or periodic drug shortages, you do need to do this kind of research, right? So let's take an example from the pandemic to try and think about when we use what kind of method, okay? So if you did um, a study of uh, people who work in crematoriums, right, during the pandemic, if you did a survey, right, with fixed questions and fixed answers, you would get some information. You would see broad-based patterns. If you started interviewing uh, these people who work in these crematoriums, open-ended interviews, you would get more information about what it is that they did, feel, experience, etc. Now, if you actually did those interviews and also uh, actually sat in the crematorium for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, etc., the amount of information you get is even more, right, to understand the complexity of how this works and how they manage, right? That is, in fact, an ethnographic qualitative approach. Okay, so similarly, um, there continue to be significant gender differences between men and women in different countries today, whether in terms of clothing, educational performance, or professional choice, right? Now, you can get evidence of this from a variety of sources, including surveys and reports of test scores. You don't need to do this in-depth field work uh, which involves staying in a place, interviewing people to establish this difference in gender, right? But if you want to ask another set of questions, right, for example, um, when do you find in a situation where there is gender difference, where do we see gender equality? Okay, how is it that people are socialized or, uh, uh, into being different genders, right? How is it that gender difference plays out in a context where gender equality is espoused, at least on paper, officially, etc.? To answer any of these questions, you are going to have to do in-depth qualitative work, right? Whether it is in interviews and if you combine this with participant observation in the field, you are going to get an even richer and thicker picture of uh, what this means and how it plays out in people's lives. So ethnography, participant observation, which includes interviews and talking to people, allows the researcher to discover and analyze the categories and questions that are most relevant for the people being studied and participating in the research, right? And that's how something you find out because you've been there the whole time. So you know, in fact, what their own terms are for how life is playing out, right? Ethnography allows the researcher to examine how people's actions compare to what they say about their actions in ideal situations and their thoughts or opinions on particular topics, right? Sometimes there's a discrepancy between different perspectives between what people say and do. And in fact, this is a problem for people who do surveys, right? Because when you ask someone in a survey instrument, what do you think about X? They tell you often what they think you want to hear. Right? That's also true of an interview. A person can choose their words and their stories uh, based on how they'd like to present themselves. But if you are actually immersed in the field right, and you are staying in a place doing participant observation, doing this kind of ethnographic work, then you will see. You will see the discrepancy between what people say and do. And sometimes this itself will lead you to a series of questions that actually did not, you do not think of because you didn't even know this phenomena existed. So one of the rules of this kind of qualitative research then is that having different perspectives or contradictions is not a problem. In fact, the different perspectives, gender, age, ethnicity, the contradictions that are apparent, in fact, often tell us much more about the phenomena than if it appeared like everything was smooth and run right the way people said that they should those are ideal types right um, and how you are positioned yourself within the field will give 
will show you some things and not other things right so very often you can find in people who use qualitative methods men for example will write do not have access to women in the household right so they are presenting then a particular perspective yeah and these are some things to think about when you put together your research so one of the rules of this kind of research is that contradictions multiple perspectives right are a good things right because they show us in fact how things actually work in uh, everyday life right and that different people do different things differently they are positioned differently they have different responses to different things um there might be a discrepancy between how people uh, act and what they say they are going to do and in fact when you answer the question for example uh, let's take our question on uh, whether women are able to go out and choose work freely that might uh involve in fact a lot of negotiation right within families etc and if you are present then you will see this negotiation which reflects in fact multiple perspectives and apparent contradictions right these are things that are not so easy to get through survey instruments so in many ways the ethnographer or the person being participant observation is a student and the people you are working with i or teachers who are explaining to you how the their particular situation their world their family their bazaar their institution work right um, and you should adopt this position it can be useful um, because it highlights the fact that you actually don't know that much and the people who you are working with are the really knowledgeable people right but it also uh, highlights how much how important their knowledge is right so we are looking for this perspective from the ground up and this is what participant observation interviews ethnography qualitative methods is best at revealing right what is the situation on the ground ordinary everyday people how do they experience things um and this requires you as someone who is collecting information remember in all of this you are the instrument of research right it's your survey to make it it's your interviews you're doing it's your participant observation it requires you to demonstrate respect uh, and provide assistance to the people you're working with when appropriate um now while you are doing this work then uh, interviewing meeting people observing events etc right participating in the daily routines of the setting developing relations um you uh, start taking notes right these are called field notes right you start taking notes in a regular systematic way of things you observe and learn right while doing this work yeah and over time as you accumulate these notes of these obs observations experiences and interviews which may or may not be taped you will start getting then uh, generating a body of data so you can take field notes that describe people events conversations practices in the field even if your primary data is in the form of interviews case studies or questionnaires right the important element here is to be able to use your data collected in the field to provide your reader with a thick description of the phenomena and place you are studying and provide an analysis which answers your research question based on data you have collected in the field in that sense this data uh which is basically a recording of your interactions observations conversations interviews case studies etc is the primary form of evidence to which you will answer the research question that you first started with so um ethnography and participant observation talk to the messiness of life that is their primary uh goal as a research method uh it is a uh, Immersion in a field site is a powerful and fundamental part of ethnography as a research strategy because it allows us to appreciate multiple perspectives and to engage different types and sources of data not just spoken or visual but also sensorial or behavior right because you know when we behave observe how we interact in the world how we are in the world is not limited to our words it's also limited to our actions gestures facial expressions modes of being and close observation of all of this will uh, reveal things which sometimes even the person who is expressing them is not aware of right and it gives us then this experiential understanding of fundamental common trends of the cultural and social worlds of the people we are working with so in other words qualitative research methods and especially ethnography and participant observation are 
designed to provide access to kinds of information that are not readily obtainable through relatively detached approaches like surveys and observations where you may come for a, you know, a survey might take half an hour and you might never encounter this person before or after, right? So this is a different kind of method which can be used as a complement when the survey re reveals the pattern. You can use these qualitative methods to understand why uh, things are happening the way they are. Now, of course, and the ethnographer, participant, observer cannot take in everything, right? Either he or she will, in conjunction with those in the setting, develop certain perspectives by engaging in some activities and some relationships other than others. And this um, affinity with some people and not with others could also be political. It would express different kinds of viewpoints, and that itself will tell us something about the setting. So the idea here is not to tell the truth, right? Your question that you asked, uh, for example, about the modernness of women, about making free choices about work, about what they believe in ethnic riots, about um, etc. What is their idea of religiosity? There is not a truthful answer to this, right? But what is apparent then are the multiple truths through which different sets of people live their lives. Now, the important thing to remember, especially in context of qualitative methods, right, is that life, the everyday life we lead, even of ordinary people like us, exceed any conceptual or intellectual abstract box that you can, in fact, produce, right? And in this way, participant observation, ethnography, qualitative methods uh, allows for uh, some glimpse into the depth, breadth, and diversity of life's forms and perspectives, ways of living and believing, and the complex ways that social phenomena may be related, right? So I know I've talked a lot about in this lecture about people, but you can also try and think about any of this in terms of institutions. For example, if you go back to our Tanzanian example, of course, healthcare systems are designed, right? There are protocols in place. There are positions in place. Those positions have terms of reference. There is, but we all know that all workplaces have contradictions. We know that they have politics. We know that things go wrong. We know that new initiatives are taken. And all of these things, before or, uh, uh, they are put in official documents, and some of them might not even be put in official documents, right? But if you ask the question of how does this institution work, it does not only work in the ways that are laid down in the rules. There might be all kinds of other ways. And that is what this immersion in a field site, qualitative methods, getting close to people, understanding their perspective, understanding their lives, in fact, reveals. So to capture this, you need to immerse, learn, listen, hear, observe, empathize when in the field, and write and record everything you see in detail. Okay, so given that there are all these contradictions and multiple perspectives, how do we deal with it, right? We are going to suggest that we are trying to think of multiple truths, but how do we manage it in terms of the research design? Here it's important to think of something called triangulation. In social science research, the term triangulation is used to refer to the observation of the research issue from at least two different points of view. And this can include the different points of view that you are presented with in the field. And so the question is to try and think about are these people saying similar things or different things? What are the differences and similarities? Right? What does it mean that these differences and similarities actually uh, exist? And you can then use this method to do two things. But first, to try and think about, is it that everyone is telling you the same story, right? Because one person's version of the truth and somebody else's. So, and then if you do find discrepancies in what people are telling you, you can try and think about why is that their difference in how people perceive things. And that can be put down to maybe their social position. Is it that older people see things differently from younger people? Is it that men see things differently from women? Is it that people in power see different things differently from those who are powerless? And this is how you, in fact, build a research project and build a research findings that actually include these multiple perspectives. Okay, so once you've been to the field and you have collected all of this data, now what should we do with it, right? Because we have to actually produce a research project that has finding. So the last step of the process is to analyze data, right? 
Uh, now, in especially in qualitative methods, including ethnography, the research process is necessarily inductive. In other words, we have not gone out with a hypothesis, which we are trying to test. That is what you do mostly with quantitative methods, right? And your quest survey questionnaire is then designed to either prove that hypothesis or disprove it. But as we have seen, ethnography and participant observation and qualitative methods are a different uh, focus, right? They are trying to understand the complex uh, depth and contradictions of everyday life and knowledge. So instead of testing a hypothesis, what we try and do is, is we try and present the voice of the people who we have tried to work with. So we try and look at the data very closely, examine the patterns, and then from those patterns build findings which we finally connect, reconnect with here. So the first step is to really identify themes and categories. So you take all of your notes and all of your interviews which you transcribe, that is you actually write down the whole interview um, and prepare your data for, uh, these, uh, for doing this kind of data analysis, right? And as I said in the beginning, social science research is fundamentally interested in finding patterns, right? And these patterns, when things exist in a pattern, they tell us they are not about one person's lives, but that they are a pattern across people's lives. So what you do to, for data analysis is to look very closely at your field notes, your interview transcripts, any other material you might have collected, to try and think about themes, concepts, words, events that emerge in across the data, across people's interviews, field notes, etc., which can produce in fact a pattern right uh, and what we try and do is literally sit with our uh, data and you do the same if you were in a survey right if you were to try and s assess how many people children go to school and how many children don't you would actually count up the number right so you would say 20 children go to school and 20 children do not that is a pattern right and it's the same way it is the repet repetition of a word a concept an expression a gesture an act a uh, feeling, an ideation, an argument, etc., that you start seeing across your interviews with or data with different sets of people that therefore produces a pattern, right? So the job then of the analyst is to bridge the gaps between specific things, right, this specific incident with other things that they have encountered in the field to try and find a pattern, right, and use these patterns then to relate to the big picture questions that they ask. So if you ask the question of how is it, is, is, uh, what is the capacity of Indian women to be modern if modern is considered the capacity to freely seek work of their choice, you do a set of interviews and participant observation with some young women who are trying to look for jobs or who are trying to negotiate with their families to look for jobs. And across this data that you collect, then you start seeing the words, the feelings, the experiences, etc., that they've had. And when you start seeing them across people's lives, you begin to see that there is a pattern. And that then is a social pattern, right? And that reveals something about society, not just the person uh, that you've talked to. Now, you can also find that these patterns might have contradictions, they might be true for some people and they might not be for others, and that's when you start asking the questions of representativeness, of positionality, of triangulation. Who is it that had an easier time going out to do this, find this job on their own, in their own choices? Who had a harder time? Why? That's another set of questions, right? That, and the answers of which are available in the data when you look at it closely, and which will finally end up answering the questions that you uh, uh, started out with in the first place. So the thing you're trying to identify is the themes that appear in stories, phrases, symbol, ideas, events that appear and reappear multiple times. The recurrence across people's lives, experiences, encounters that you've had with different people are a good indicator of their um, significance. The more frequently a symbol, idea, emotion, event, gesture, thought, word etc appears the more evidence it is that it is shared and is important to the group represented right uh, or uh, you may start noticing these potential key themes and symbols and start listing them right uh, as they appear across interviews across your field notes etc and that starts to give you uh, um, a sense of what is important now you might find that within this people have different experiences, right? So we go back to our example, some women had no problem 
choosing work quickly some people had to negotiate some people were entirely prohibited you think about so it's not that everyone's experience is identical right but when you look at this data you can start putting these people in different sets of boxes and then you start thinking of why is it that the people who had an easy time had an easy time what are they saying why are the people who had difficult time had a difficult time what are they saying why are those who negotiated how did they negotiate on what terms what is it that finally allowed them to go out and so you already see right now that if we can answer all these questions we can in fact complete our research project now you might find contradictions as we've said two of people uh, say might say entirely different things they might not correspond with what it is that uh, what was done or what you expected but that is okay right and figuring out why these contradictions exist is quite important now when you have a body of data you need a lot of time to do this analysis right so you have to first go through all your data so you know it very well then you have to organize and sort this data in terms of questions themes moments experiences it will help you write up your findings right so you have to start taking what is a mass of unprocessed data and producing from it some form and order right uh, based on some kind of analytical frame so again i'm giving you the example those who could go to work freely those who couldn't those had to negotiate so that's the initial cut right then within that you start asking the next question okay those who went to freely what is their socio economic background why did they have an easy time how did they describe this easy time were they uh, uh, did they think of this as something that made them modern or represented this idea of modernness in their life you can answer all those four questions you already have a set of research answers same for those who negotiated same for those who were completely unable to do this right and then your research findings would reflect this difference and similarities and you could find things that you didn't expect for example no one thinks that going out to work is a sign of being modern although intuitively that's what we think it is right working women are modern women but on the other hand you may find that the majority of women uh, are, are unable to go out and work and then the question is why and how does that make them feel about themselves in relationship to their desire aspiration etc to be the certain kind of modern woman in all of this you might define other uh, attributes of modernity you might try and think about um uh, uh how people negotiate this for example the indian literature on women and gender roles is replete with example that most women try and negotiate what they think of as modern and what they think of as traditional is this a pattern you are seeing in your interview So once you start noticing these patterns and thematics you can start actually writing up right and different thematics then produce topics sections or chapters of a final written work could be a monograph a journal article or an essay so i am going to stop now because uh, we have been given a limited time but uh, your assignment for this uh, lecture includes reading a short ethnographic piece and uh, answering some questions just so that you have a sense of what an example of this kind of qualitative ethnographic work would be thank you for your attention i hope you enjoyed the lecture